You're listening to uh, Dennis Mundy, that's me, and my co-host, Phil Goldberg, author of uh, American Veda. Uh, this is Spirit Matters Talk. Our guest today, Dr. Elizabeth Ersick. She has her undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania, her uh, MBA from the Wharton School, and her PhD from uh, Arizona State University, her PhD being in Religious Studies. Um, she has, uh, also teaches at Mesa Community College, which has the largest religious studies program at a two-year college in the nation. And uh, she was a visiting scholar at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And in addition to that, she had a fellowship at the Yale Institute of uh, Sacred Music. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so very much for taking the time uh, to come on our show today. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be with both of you. Elizabeth, let's um, start with the subject of your uh, recent book, which I understand is about to come out in paperback. Its title is its title is Women, Ritual, and Power, subtitled Placing Female Imagery of God in Christian Worship. Now, uh, we'd love to hear about the book, but in the larger uh, scope of things, you have a strong interest in the role of women in religion and um, not just in worship, but in, in religious institutions. Maybe you could uh, give us some of the background and what got you interested in that. Um, absolutely, Phil. Uh, what's very interesting is that to be living in this time when there's been a dramatic shift in the lives of men and women in the last 50 years in terms of their relationship role in the public sphere, and what they're being asked to do, both domestically and out in the world. We're rethinking ourselves. And because of that, uh, women in all aspects of their lives have made impact and change in most of the institutions that they've participated in, not the least of which is religion. And because religious studies is the area that I've um, chosen as my study and what I teach, I, I see it actually quite dramatically. I think a lot of the change that we're experiencing in society in general is reflected in religious trends like the spiritual but not religious, which we're saying is upwards of 40% of the United States now might identify like that. But even the people that continue to participate in their religions are looking for ways to articulate and make meaning of the world that they live in today with the traditions and the institutions that they participate in. So that's where my interest in women and religion came in because there had been such a shift starting in the 1960s and 70s with the women's movement. And women, for the first time, were being allowed to go and study religion at the highest levels of learning in the United States. So one way to think about this is that the religion that had been studied and replicated had been exclusively really by men uh, for the most part um, on, through the 1950s. We did have some women preachers uh, previous to that and traditions that didn't have as high um, an entry level to being a preacher or didn't believe that um, there had to be a separate category. Those forms of religion tended to have more female mm -hmm. participation. But for the most part, um, it was the women's movement opening up education and PhD programs more generally across the United States that also then opened up religious studies to women across the United States and theological studies. So for the first time, we're having women learning ancient Greek, like if we're looking at classic Christian studies, and having them study theology and how you actually write the religion. And it was during this time that women were then asking, since they're getting to go to these institutions and study it at that level, where are the women in the Bible? Where are the female images that speak to me? Where are the stories and ways of thinking about ourselves um, that speak to the, the new ways that women and men were starting to think about um, women. So that's where uh, I became very fascinated with what that is. You mentioned, uh, Dennis, my uh, fellowship at the Yale Institute mm -hmm. for Sacred Music. That 
um, study was actually to study religion and art. So in a broader way, my interest in the subject is how we express our conceptions of the divine or spirit or God, however it is in, in mm-hmm. your traditional ways of speaking of it that, that you would think of it. And so this book came out of this one particular moment in time where new eyes were coming in to look at the Bible, trying to find themselves and articulate new stories. Let me ask you, Elizabeth, uh, about uh, our culture. And uh, in the United mm-hmm. States, for instance, in, uh, in Christianity, specifically Catholicism and Judaism, women still have an incredibly small role in terms of uh, any type of authority or any type of really... Um, uh, uh, the activities of those religions. And specifically, I'll talk about Catholicism because we have a Pope now that most consider, and I, I certainly consider very progressive on many, many issues, but still in Catholicism, the role of women, uh, they can't hold any really kind of positions of authority or power. Why isn't there more pressure on the, the Catholic Church, for instance, to change? Why, um, wh- wh- why did they get away with this? They're, they seem to be about 200 years behind the times in regard to this. Um, and and certainly it must be an area that, uh, you know, uh, comes to your attention often. Well, uh, Dennis, I I actually can speak to that because um, my family background is Catholic, and uh, I'm also a spiritual director at a Franciscan Renal Center, which is a Catholic Mm -hmm. center here in Arizona. I would say that, first of all, religious institutions have attention and specifically the older ones. You mentioned Judaism and you mentioned Catholicism. You could put in Eastern Orthodox, you could put in um, traditional Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all of this. The tension is how do you keep true to the tradition as you continue to speak and make yourself relevant and speak to the needs of your faithful and people that practice your religion today. So so that's the tension. I would say on a personal level, I agree with you. I think Pope Francis um, would do volumes just as he just recently did for the environment and Mm -hmm. um, and other issues that he's been very um, uh, forthright about um, to address the issue of women. And we'll have to see. We'll have to see if he will make more um, about this issue about ordination. I think ordination is at the key of what you're speaking about. Mm -hmm. The truth is is that women are having much greater roles in um, Catholicism in terms of opening up the way the liturgy gets performed. Um, Lay people now do readings. They help share in the communion. These are the kind of the sacred things that happen during the service. Um, which Catholics would call a Mass. In Judaism, um, I would like to point out that there are four major branches of Judaism, three of which have female rabbis. So it's only about Orthodox Judaism that um, restrict women from actually being rabbis. But um, being a very good friend with um, one of the female rabbis here in my state, I can uh, absolutely say that um, she is uh, an inspiration, an authority, and a guide for her congregation. So um, I would say that's the tension, how to keep the tradition, how to make it current. And um, what I was just speaking about, the women's movement, is the area that has put pressure on um, these religions to consider change. And both of those institutions actually did. Elizabeth, your your book um, it focuses on the imagery, female imagery of God, not only in the, I guess in the Bible, but in in religious art. Um, it seems to me that part of what we're talking about here is also a split because um, in the Eastern traditions there's always been this uh, reverence for the female aspect of the divine. So in Hinduism, you have all the the female goddesses and the sort of equal representation of Shiva and Shakti and so forth. And in in Buddhism, you have images like Kuan Yin and Tara. Um, But yet, throughout the centuries, it's been a male-dominated 
um, inst- institutionally male dominated. It's only been recently that we have an ad- the advent of um, female le- leadership in, in, uh, among gurus and yogis and so forth. Um, and similarly, here, the Catholics have always venerated the image of Mary. Uh, Jews have Shekinah, the female concept. But in actual day-to-day running of uh, ritual and liturgy and institutional uh, dynamics, it's been very male-dominated. Can you uh, address that, that sort of split of worshiping the feminine and yet keeping women out of positions of power? Well, I would, as I just explained, I would say that we've seen um, a dramatic shift in some of that, some more progressively than others, as Dennis rightly pointed out, there's still some areas that haven't seen the complete shift. But even in your book, Phil, um, American Veda, you end the book with talking about the feminization Mm -hmm. of the Hindu movement here in America. And I would actually compare that with what I just spoke about of the women's movement coming stronger and stronger that this new wave of Hinduism that came to America in in the last quarter of the 20th century had to um, move with that as well Mm -hmm. because it had so many female um, participants Mm -hmm. in it. Um, But to your larger point, I think it's a very good point. Just because you have a gendered image of the divine, be it male or female, a lot of this has to do with why, why is that image being pulled forward over all other images? What is the message coming with that image and what is the instruction with it? And in ancient times, if only men were allowed to read, if only men were allowed to write, if only men were allowed to lead, then the female images that got brought forward are are being put forward in a way that is to speak to the society as it is organized. So just because you have a female deity of some kind does not necessarily um, translate to having female authority within the religion. Mm -hmm. However, um, a religion that does not have female authority on a human level in its hierarchy, um, if it doesn't have any female imagery of the divine, has in its stories a justification for why the intermediary or why the the person who is um, uh, representing or being the one to translate the divine message into the human realm, um, why it shouldn't be female if only male was represented which is why this work that I end up pulling out in my book becomes so important. Um, What's very interesting in the Christian Bible is that there are references to um, female images of God. Um, For Christians, where they have this Trinitarian understanding classically spoken of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, meaning there are three different ways that it gets seen, um, in a non-gendered way, it could be creator, redeemer, sustainer. There's a lot of different analogies that have been used on how this one substance can have three forms. But what that does is it introduces a certain amount of mystery. And it says that no matter what way you see it, um, there are other ways to also see it in how it's been revealed. So if you look into the Bible, there are actually multiple, multiple images of how this mystery is is expressed, how it's presented. Um, some of them na- nature images, um, and also since we have so many masculine images of this, there are female images. And probably the most prolific character written about as a female character, as a reflection of God, is what I would call Lady Wisdom. Um, She begins in the book of Proverbs. She's very prevalent through the wisdom literature, which are the last books in the Hebrew Bible. And um, she's referenced um, in the Gospels in terms of her scripture passages being retold and being retold as Jesus is the incarnate of this. So um, 
she's right there. And uh, what's fascinating to me is how little, both in Judaism and in Christianity and in Islam, Mm -hmm. um, she gets preached about. So I went and did the research when I was at Yale about her references scripturally, and then I went out to find the communities that were actually using this imagery in their worship. Because what I noticed, and again, my focus is religion and art, is that while most of these religious traditions are very robust and have a lot of nuance if you look deeply into them, for the majority of the participants, It's what gets presented during group worship or group gathering or the main themes. That is what people say is the tradition. Mm -hmm. So even though it's all throughout the Bible, if you never (coughs) preach on those passages, talk about those passages, paint a picture about those passages, tell the stories about those passages, you're going to have a congregation of people who say, well, that's obviously not part of my tradition. If I could interrupt for a second, uh, for those just tuning in, you're listening to uh, Spirit Matters Talk with uh, Phil Goldberg and uh, Dennis Mundy. Our guest today, Dr. Elizabeth Orsick. Her book, Women, Ritual, and Power, Placing Female Imagery of God in Christian Christian Worship. Uh, her website, uh, ElizabethOrsic.com. That's Elizabeth, U-R-S-I-C.com. I, I want to uh, uh, ask you a question, uh, Dr. Orsick, and that is you're an mm-hmm. academic. You, you teach uh, religious studies. My understanding in the academic world, if you're teaching anything about religion, uh, you, you don't have to be a believer. You can approach it purely academically. A friend of mine who teaches religious studies uh, t- told me that. Now, I'm just wondering, uh, with you, is, is religion something you, you approach purely academically? Or are, are, you, you know, what, what, are you a believer? Are, are you a actual practitioner in a religion? And uh, for somebody out there that's a that's maybe agnostic, uh, uh, what what why uh, for what reason uh, do you? Uh, I don't mean agnostic. Somebody that's an atheist, if they're out there, uh, what do you get out of religion? Why would you practice religion? Let me take a um, a step back first. It is true. I find it very interesting in the academy that. Religious studies is perhaps the one field where saying that you don't actually believe in the subject gives you more credibility. Mm. If you really think uh-huh. about it, it's pretty funny. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that, and I'll get that, to that in a moment. But um, if you were to present yourself as a psychologist, um, one would hope that you truly do believe that the mind is is a key for how you understand the world and people, or if you're a chemist, that um, that the chemicals that run through everything open up such understanding to our understanding of the world. So um, I, I like to, and this is going to be <laughs> religious language, I would say in the academy that each discipline has a sacred wound. I have seen it in other disciplines, some disciplines like anthropology, archaeology, you know, the difference between hard science versus interviewing people, you know, things versus people might be it. Um, Quantitative versus qualitative research, you find that in the area of communications and maybe sociology. These are huge debates that go among academics. Well, when you move into the history of what religious studies is, this field actually develops as the non-faith perspective of how to study the phenomenon of religion. This is in contrast to what had been, which had only been theological seminaries, uh, places where you learned about the religion from a faith perspective. And so that is the sacred wound, the way that this, to study religion from a cultural, historical, sociological, psychological, anthropological perspective um, is a different way than the way theology had been studied, taught, and replicated for, well, millennia. So that's why this discipline privileges a non-faith perspective in its analysis. I think that that's actually a great contribution to the world, even to a faith perspective, 
because even a faith believer, as we're just talking, if the religion is not speaking to the matters of the day, um, negotiating the major issues of the day, um, participating in coming to some type of understanding, resolution, movement forward with the greatest crises of the day, then it's not doing its job. So I don't see religious studies as um, being divorced from the faith perspective. Um, there are many people in this field that um, are fascinated by a phenomena that seems to, let's be honest, from Stone Age, because the way people get buried in some systematic manner, we think they believe they were going someplace. So in every culture, in every age, in every epoch, we have what we might point to as a religious impulse. And so explaining why that is and how that is, um, if there is not something greater, is, is a very interesting question. Mm-hmm. However, people that do have faith can do this analysis, and many people do. So you have church historians, you have literature and um, language scholars, you have all different kinds of people, some of which work within a religious institutional academic setting, some who work outside of it. In addition, um, scholars of this field can, on a personal level, either be faith believers and have some type of a practice or not. And I would say that what is expected in terms of academic rigor is that when you come and present a paper, that your role there is to actually be talking about the cultural, social, historical perspective, shedding light possibly on theological understanding, but to be presenting that. But um, on a personal level, I think each of us comes into the subject in their own way. And I would say that I definitely have a fascination. I, Phil and I have actually had these kinds of conversations where if you have some type of experience that takes you into a realm that, that opens up a world that goes beyond what you can touch, feel, and see, then you ask yourself, what is this? And if in the exploration of that you become a better person. Is that a religious path? Is that a spiritual path? Um, mm-hmm. I think that goes to each person on, yeah. on what they uh, Phil, we got, we got about six minutes left. I, wanted, I know you had some questions you wanted to get in. Oh, I got tons of them, but we'll have to uh, revisit with Elizabeth another time. Um, Elizabeth, one of the uh, interesting things about you is that you teach at a two-year community college. Um, I'm curious about your experience teaching religion, um, and I I assume comparative religion, to um, students in a community college in in Phoenix. What what are you finding among young people in terms of their understanding and their interest in this subject area? Well, I would say that there is um, a very strong interest in the subject area. I'd like to contrast it. I was um, teaching part-time when I was back on the East Coast at Yale. Um, I would say that out here in the Arizona area, on the East Coast, my students were maybe 25% were actively participating in something, Um, though I would say probably two-thirds identified with something. Um, maybe they only went to worship when they went home to, you know, a family event or something like that, but they would still identify that way. But only 25% would occasionally go to something on their own. Out here in Arizona, I find it can be upwards of two-thirds. Um, the uh, Mesa Community College is a, Mesa itself is a section of Phoenix that was settled by Mormons. It's the largest um, community of Latter-day Saints outside of the state of Utah. So in my classroom, I generally have one or two people that have already given two years of their life to go on a mission before they came to college. That really changed the conversation. Put on top of that, that we're the fifth largest city in the United States, and community college is the least expensive way to begin, um, I should say most affordable way to begin your college education. Um, we are very attractive first place for college for immigrant students. 
So um, after we have a very strong in English as a Second Language program at our school, and uh, World Religions is one of the top five courses after the students get through their ESL mm -hmm. track of courses they want to take. I, um, I could say it's because they already have a broader world view. Um, I could also say maybe as a teacher that uh, they figure, well, at least they'll pass the Buddhism test if they're from Vietnam. Um, <laughs> so it could be, uh, could be a little bit more uh, pragmatic than that. I would have thought your uh, student body was primarily a Catholic, given the, um, mm -hmm. the, the uh, Latino population of, of Phoenix. But uh, this sounds like it's much more diverse than I, I thought. Absolutely. Um, we have a lot of students, actually, right now from Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Wow. Um, they're coming to study at ASU, and starting with us, they get a uh, little stronger language skills before they get into their hard engineering and business classes. Wow. Um, very interesting next. Fascinating. Are they open? Hey, uh, we have about three minutes left. i got to keep a watch on the time here. Uh, Rita, where, where do you... Uh, see your direction of research and activity over the next five to ten years. What would you like to see uh, uh, on your plate as we go forward? Well, thank you very much for asking about that. So this first book was about female imagery that's being shown in Christian worship, what you need to do to actually get it done, because a lot of people tried and had it shut down for a lot of reasons that we've already mentioned in this interview. Coming out of that, I realized that there is a because of the spiritual but not religious, seeing this in the classroom, my next research, and I've already begun on this, is to look at the categories that religious studies uses from a non-faith perspective and use that as a way to help the spiritual but not religious have a fuller spiritual practice. We identify belief, we identify myth, we identify ethics, we identify um, pilgrimage. We, uh, there's so many different ways religious studies actually breaks this subject apart, and my next book is to actually write about each of these and do it in a way that a spiritual but not religious person can actually find out how ritualistic they are, how mythic they are, how ethic-driven they are. And for a person of faith that does work within a particular system, they can also use the book to see if they could bring other aspects of what religion offers into their life. Lovely. Wonderful. I'll look uh, forward again, to conversations again, with you about that. Yeah. Again, <laughs> uh, women, ritual, and power, placing female imagery of God in Christian worship. Uh, Phil, uh, one, uh, we have a minute left, so one quick question. Ah, I just was curious about how open-minded you find these, this diverse group of people that you're now teaching at, at the community college. How open are they and how eager are they to learn about other traditions other than their own? Well, the students self-select this class, so I'm not having to teach to students that are reluctant to study math or something like that. So um, I find them to be very open, very eager, and I love the 18, 19, 20-year-old range because um, it's about self-definition, self-exploration, um, giving a safe space for people to have these dialogues that they haven't been able to have before is incredibly exciting. I can say I'm very, very hopeful of what's coming down the pike in terms of our future leaders by what I'm seeing in this classroom. Fantastic. Good to hear. Uh, you're listening to Phil Goldberg and uh, Dennis Ramundi, Spirit Matters Talk. Our guest today, Dr. Elizabeth Orsic, her book, Women, Ritual, and Power, Placing Female Imagery of God in Christian Worship. Her website, Elizabeth Orsic, U-R-S-I-C, U-R-S-I-C. Dot com. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so very much for taking the time to come on with us today. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks, Elizabeth.